Aloha. Welcome to another episode of Hawaii's Living Legend Lawyers. Sponsored by the Hawaii State Bar Association and Think Tech Hawaii, this is a tribute to our three digit attorneys. And what I mean by that are these are the attorneys with three digits in their bar number. It's attorneys that were admitted to practice in the 1960s, 1970s. This is being done as an initiative of Greg Markham, our current president of the Hawaii State Bar Association, and part of an effort to preserve the legacy of some of the legal pioneers in our bar. My name is Craig Wagnold. I'm very happy and honored to serve as a host of today's program. I was a 2013 uh, president of the Hawaii State Bar Association. Currently, I'm a partner at the law firm of Bayes, Long, Rose, and Holt. It's great to be here. Today's program, you're going to want to see this. Okay, so if you're standing up, sit down. If you're sitting down, lie down. If you're lying down, grab a bag of corn, grab a beer or whatever beverage of your choice, and watch because we are here with two of the pioneer attorneys from the island of Kauai, our Garden Isle. Right to my immediate left, we have Walter Hong. And right, Walton. I'm sorry, Walton, thank you. <laughs> Walton Hong, and we have Gerald Matsunaga. Walton, I am interested to, to, to hear some things about you, but let me tell you a little bit about him to start with. He graduated from the University of Hawaii in 1966, went on to law school at Hastings in, uh, in uh, San Francisco, and graduated from there in 69 began uh, work as a deputy attorney general in June 1969, and uh, then went on in 72 to be a partner in the law firm of Matsu Matsuoka and Hong, uh, and uh, then went on to have his own private practice and uh, also works as a per diem judge. Gerald Matsunaga. Now, I followed this. He, he attended Colorado State uh, College moved on to Oregon State University, where he got his degree, and then went on to law school at Drake University School of Law uh, in Des Moines, Iowa. Graduated from there in 63. For uh, two years after that, he served as a law clerk to Chief Justice Wilford Tsukiyama, and uh, then went on to serve as Deputy Attorney General, as legal counsel with the Legal Aid Society, Deputy uh, County Attorney for a few years after that, Deputy State Public Defender of the Kauai Office, and then uh, was elected to be, serve as a prosecuting attorney in the county of Kauai until he became a district court judge uh, with the 5th uh, district and also served as a per diem judge as well, correct? Yes. Quite impressive histories, but I, I'm more interested to hear some of the stories and, and, and how you got into this uh, practicing law. If we can, uh, Gerald, can we start with you? Tell me a little bit about how you got into to, to law and what took you on that path. I was telling Walton uh, I had no intentions of becoming a lawyer. I went to school, and at one of the meetings, Hawaii Club meetings, this guy was saying how difficult it was to become a lawyer. And he boasted so much that I said, okay, if you can make it, anybody else can. <laughs> <laughs> so that got me into law school. Then when I came out and I clerked for Chief Justice uh, Wilfred Tsukiyama, he did it more subtly because I told him, I'm not sure if I'm going to take the bar exam because I'm not sure if I want to practice law. And he didn't say anything. He just told me, you're not a lawyer until you pass the bar. <laughs> I thought about it. I said, OK, fine. I'm going to take the bar. Pass the bar. I said, what are you going to do? I said, I don't know. Um, I don't think I'm going to practice law because I don't think I feel comfortable. You're not a lawyer until you try a case. <laughs> he got me thinking, and finally I said, OK, I want to be a lawyer. I better go try a case. And that's how it started, uh, through yeah. the guidance of Chief Justice Tsukiyama. And, I, and you have some other stories there as well, which I want to hear about. But I, I'm, I'm interested, uh, Walton, how did you get a similar type experience, or had you all <coughs> No, mine was a little different. My parents were poor, so I kind of struggled Came my way through law um, undergraduate work. And when I was a senior at UH, I was told that if I wanted to go to graduate school, I had a scholarship waiting for me, or I could go to law school. And I sat there and I thought, you know what? Coming from a poor family, I then thought attorneys made more money than graduate students. So I chose to go to law school instead. And it just, just kind of carried on its own course. 
I see. And and you picked uh, to, to head over to San Francisco, or you had had other plans, or no? Because as it, because my family was poor, um, I had to pick. At that time, there was no law school at UH, law school. so I had to pick the closest law school, public law school, if possible, and that's how I ended up at Hastings. How did you pick Des Moines, Iowa's Drake University for law school? By mistake. <laughs> <laughs> I went there to, to go to graduate school in business, okay. and then I got sidetracked. But uh, I always thought Kauai was a you know, pretty dead town until I went to Des Moines, Iowa. Then I really appreciated the Hui Kauai. <laughs> there were more activities in the Hui than in Des Moines, Iowa. Well, now, I understand. I had to look up some interesting facts. Apparently, you couldn't dance between about the hours of midnight and 6 a.m. or something like that uh, in, when you were there in Des Moines. Is that, was yeah. that an issue for you? No, I, I, I don't dance, so it wouldn't be an issue. <laughs> <laughs> but I know it was a dry state. Well, you finished law school, came back, and served as a, as a law clerk, as you mentioned, uh, for C.J. Tsukiyama. Can you tell us a little bit about how, how that went and, and about the man that he was? Okay, I have the greatest admiration for Chief Justice Wilfred Tsukiyama. And in my opinion, he is the most brilliant legal person that I have ever met in my life. He had read every single Supreme Court decision from Volume 1 through the time that he was sitting. And he had a photographic memory, and he could tell you exactly where, you know, what case. If there was a particular issue, he would tell you to go to volume seven, territory versus so-and-so, what page, and he could quote a paragraph from that Supreme Court decision. That's amazing. The guy had a fantastic name. He was the most humble person I ever met in the legal profession. Next to you. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Well, and, and you had mentioned, in fact, uh, at one time late in his career, he'd, he'd actually called you in and, and without any books or any references whatsoever, was, was telling you what to be quoted from. Yeah. He, he could, he had a photographic me uh, memory, so if there was a particular issue, he would just tell you, pick these volumes, look at these cases, He'd give you the name of the case, the page, and the, what paragraph you could find, whatever he wanted quoted. So, you know, he, he had very little to do as a law clerk because he did all of this work <laughs> in his head. The guy was brilliant. Wow. And he was a very humble man. Well, you came out of law school and came back and started right away as the deputy attorney general. Right. right. I was born and raised in Honolulu. Honolulu so, right. came here and looked for a job, and the only job that I could find was working for the attorney general's office. So, started working there, and after about two and a half years, the opportunity came to <coughs> move to one of the neighbor islands. Actually, my wife, then wife, and I thought about moving to one of the neighbor islands because it used to take me 45 minutes to drive to work uh -huh. and over an hour to go home. And I said, you know, this is ridiculous. So we talked about going to one of the neighbor islands, and um, I actually was thinking of Maui. Then Judge Masuoka and I, George Masuoka, yeah. And I were classmates in law school. And I just ran into him a, a few months earlier on the street. And he said, hey, um, and I told him, we're thinking of moving to one of the neighbor islands. And after a while, he called me and he said, you want to come to Kauai to work? And I said, well, what's the deal? He said, well, um, Morris Shinsaro, who's an old time practitioner, sole practitioner on Kauai, was going to trade places with Masuoka. Masuoka was then the acting county attorney and Shinsaro was private practice, and because they wanted his uh, high retirement, with high three, they decided they're going to switch positions. But it's, it's kind of funny because Shinsaro had, if I remember, three conditions. One, Masoka had to bring in somebody else <laughs> to work with him. We had to stay together for at least one year to finish up his cases. And the third condition is the funniest. We had to pay off a $700 typewriter he just bought. <laughs> so we took over his practice and um, just kept on going. And I think Judge Masoka and I were partners for about 16 years, 18 years before, we, before he went on the bench. And then I went to private by myself. How was that change? You're jumping from here in Honolulu to Kauai. 
new new location. You hadn't lived there before, correct? Mm -hmm. That's correct. So, in, in relatively small community, by by at least by the standards that, that you'd been in Honolulu before that stay in San Francisco. I mean, this was a small legal community. Was that a difficult transition? Uh, it was. It was different. It was very different because I think all the attorneys on the island at the time probably didn't number more than a dozen, yeah. and you knew all the. Practi um, private practitioners. It was a, it was like a real family. Yeah, you you represented clients against the other attorney, but you'd say like, um, for example, Clinton Shirishi, retired. We, you know, not today where, if you get a stipulation for an extension of time, needing a, a um, signature of a judge, those days were just, hey Clint, you know what? I need two weeks. How's that? Yeah, no problem. That was yeah. a, it was a very informal. Yeah practice, yet everybody was courteous to each other. Mm -hmm. And that's the way, I mean, from the Bar Association standpoint, from a lot of members of the Bar, I mean, that's the way we want it to be, and yet the larger it gets, the more, it, it seems like the more difficult it is to maintain that. Yes. We didn't need rules of civility at the time. Yeah. <laughs> People were very, you know, as Walton said, we had, I think, less than 12 attorneys on the island. And we all knew each other and we all could work with it. We could just pick up the phone and I could call Walton or Walton could call uh, Morris mm. and we could work things out. We didn't have to put it in writing. Yeah. yeah. You know, you kept your word. And Joe, you're from, born and raised in, in, yeah, in Kauai, yes? Yes, born and raised. Okay. And, and so was it ever a, a, a thought of yours to, to stay in Honolulu or to practice somewhere else or did you always plan to go back? Uh, no, I always wanted to come back to Kauai. Yeah. But I realized that you needed experience in Honolulu first because you don't have that many cases on Kauai. So I took a job in Honolulu mm -hmm. to get the experience. Because on working for the county, if you tried one case every so often, that was just a lot of cases. <laughs> <laughs> in Honolulu, that would be, you know, a one of many more, a day. Right? Yeah. 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 So if you wanted experience, you come to Honolulu, get the experience, practice right. here. So what point did you move back, and uh, how, how long had you been practicing when you moved back over to Kauai? Uh, let's see, I moved back uh, when there was an opening in the county attorney's office. Okay. Because uh, Kabutan was a county attorney, and he had Kei Hirano and Ed Malapit, and Kabutan became the uh, circuit court judge. So there was a vacancy, and I got a call from Kei Hirano, and I took the job. In those days, there were only three of us. Low man on the totem pole took all criminal cases. Oh. <laughs> district court, family court. No, I, I don't think it was family court. District court and circuit court. That's right. In those days, the county attorney handled both the criminal yeah, both, and civil. Both yeah. criminal and civil. It was court counsel and prosecuting attorney's office in, with a three-man office. Wow. See, uh, most people can't even imagine that it would work that way or that, yeah. that, that you could do it's, it's amazing because you go to grand jury, then you have to run out to the district. <laughs> if there's a circuit court motion, you have to run back again because you're the low man on a totem pole. Yeah. yeah. And you just wait for the next guy to come in, huh? <laughs> Hopefully. Walton, when, when you made a, a change, I think this was back in 72 or so, to, to, mm -hmm. to go into private practice. Um, was that, was that a difficult change in the sense of, I mean, you, you've told how it came about, but was there a, a big change for you in, in the nature of now you've got to find clients, now you've got to... Well, as I said, we took over Marsh and Sato's practice. We sure. had to step into a practice. But it's funny because I can relate this now because when you look back, I said, boy, at that time I thought, did I make a worse mistake in my life? After the first year of practice, Mr. Maso and I earned grand sum of $3,200 a piece. <laughs> and I was saying, what am I doing, guy? <laughs> Can I maybe make a living here? Yeah. But then circumstances changed, and I was very fortunate um, due to a set, of, a set of circumstances that kind of led me down a different kind of path. My, actually, my whole idea was moving to a neighbor island for quiet rural practice, if there's such an animal that exists. Yeah. And as I used to tell people before, I moved to Kauai to get out of the rat race, but the rats caught up and passed me on the fly. <laughs> <laughs> All right, well, 
We're going to come back. I've got a lot more to ask you about. We're going to take a break right now. You're watching Hawaii's Living Legend Lawyers brought to you by the Hawaii State Bar Association, Think Tech Hawaii. We'll be right back. Here's the deal. Um, I'm Jay Fidel. I'm the host of uh, Hawaii, the State of Clean Energy, which is the Energy Policy Forum's program on Wednesday. That's how we call Wednesday Energy Wednesday. We call it Energy Wednesday every Wednesday. <laughs> Are you surprised? Okay, and we and we try to we get guys like Jim Alberts here from Hawaiian Electric who can tell us what's really going on in energy. We want to be informed. It's so important. It's the most important initiative in our state. <laughs> Clean energy is major. Okay, and that's why we cover it on this show. That's the deal. What do you think, Sharon? I think that's great. That's why we're here every Wednesday from four to five, and we hope you all join us so we can hear people like Jim coming on our show and co-host Ray Starling from Hawaii Energy. Okay, Jim. You've been here today, you've seen this, you've heard what she said, what do you think? I think it's a tremendous opportunity for people to come together and talk about the issues. Oftentimes there isn't a good forum to bring these key issues out into the public and this is a tremendous way to go about it. And the, the activity of this show is essential to keep talking about energy because as you said, it's such an essential part of our lives that we need to pay attention to it and we need to think about the future. Okay, Ray, your turn. Well, this is a special time in the history of Hawaii where we're making some pretty radical changes in the way we uh, use energy and generate energy. And this show is the one place you can count on coming to every Wednesday and hearing something about the latest issues that are on the table being discussed that will affect us all going forward. So. Uh, come join us, and if you have some ideas you want to share with us about energy, uh, give us a call and let us know. We'll, we'll put you up here and, uh, and let you talk for an hour. So uh, come see us. Thanks, Ray. Thanks, Sharon. Thanks, Jim. It's great to be, from Think Tank's point of view, it's great to have this show. We love the show. It's our, it's our most important <laughs> show. So come around and listen to us 4 to 5 on Wednesday. Thanks a lot. Bye. Aloha. Aloha. And we're back. And if you're watching, that means you're back too. And I'm glad to have you here because we're here with uh, Walton Hong and Gerald Matsunaga. This is Hawaii's Living Legend Lawyers, brought to you by the Hawaii State Bar Association and Think Tech Hawaii. I'm Craig Weigel. I'm serving as our host. And we're back to talk a little bit about practice on the island of Kauai. Gerald, you were telling us, uh, you know, even during the break, a little bit about uh, you know, some of the things that were a little different uh, on the island of Kauai in terms of, uh, of both practice and getting, uh, getting change, getting things going there, and, and, uh, and your involvement with that. Can you tell us some about some of the interesting things that you were involved with during uh, a long career? Yeah, the most interesting thing, I think, we formed what is known as the Hawaii Prosecuting Attorneys Association. Uh, prior to that, there was, no, there was no meeting of the minds among the folk prosecutors. So they would, if one particular prosecutor wanted to have a bill passed, they would go on their own. Then when we formed this uh, organization, it started off with Paul De Silva from the Big Island. Then Arthur Weoka from Maui said, okay, he wants in. And then Togo Nakagawa. And we used to meet regularly, decide what bills should have priority. Because when we met with the legislators, they would always tell us, pick and choose your three most important bills that you want passed, and we will help you. But we're not going to pass all of them. <laughs> so we would decide among us which three we wanted passed. Mm -hmm. And it, it worked. We got the bills passed. We got funding. And we always, when there was an uh, appeal to be taken, we always ran it through the other prosecuting attorneys because we didn't want to create bad law that would affect everybody down the state. Sure. So if the facts were, were, were not in favor, we would say, okay, I think we ought to back off. Don't appeal. Don't create bad law. So we had a very good working relationship among the prosecutors. I'm not sure if it still exists today, but that's how we saw it. Do you think that just you know the size, the difference, and the, and the congeniality that, that existed and, and hopefully still exists there, um, you know, led to your being able to, to, to handle things in that way, in a way that would be more difficult if there were a lot more prosecuting attorneys and a lot yeah, I think, well, more cases. That's, tr that's true, because I only had one deputy. 
It was Cliff Marquea and myself. Yeah. We were in the prosecutor's office. So there were too many of us. <laughs> and on the neighbor islands, they were likewise, they didn't have that many uh, attorneys. But we, uh, we got together and we worked together really well as a unit. And you know, we got cases. Uh, when there was a case that, that we were going to appeal because the facts were good, everybody joined in. And of course, Honu did most of the work because they had most of the oh, attorneys. Of attorneys. <laughs> and the uh, attorney general eventually joined us. Yeah. And they did a lot of the work, a lot of the mm -hmm. research. So we were fortunate because we, we only had two deputies. We, couldn't, yeah. <laughs> we didn't have manpower. Well, I, I think Gerald earlier and, and, and others have referred to your, your firm as, as having been and, and being one of the premier or the premier firm there on, on Kauai, and, and you've had all these different interesting cases. Tell us about you know, at least one or some of the experiences that you've had there that sort of are, have made its indelible mark on, on you and your career. Well, I'm not sure I refer to it as premier firm, but basically um, we took a lot of high profile cases, if you would, high profile, not in the sense of criminal law, but in the case of development, zoning mm -hmm. work, because I, the firm ended up doing a lot of administrative law, planning commission, land use commission, and the like. And um, I guess the most notable case, although I ended up on the losing end, <laughs> was the Pacific Standard versus County of Kauai case, the infamous so-called Nukuli case, mm -hmm. where um, I was retained to get zoning for a hotel. And for some reason, the, the, it, well, I know what it was now, the economy was booming at the time, and when they have a good economy, people don't want development. Mm -hmm. When they have a bad economy, they want development. Well, it was the timing was bad, and it polarized the community. And this, there was a group that started off called the Save Nukuli Committee that started a referendum drive after we got the zoning, to take mm -hmm. away the zoning. It went to an election. Um, we lost the election. The circuit court said we had vested rights. Supreme Court said, no, we didn't have vested rights. Mm. And the business community finally woke up, if you will, and said, we have to do something. Because Kauai was getting a really horrible reputation. I heard one story that this particular case was discussed as far away as London, about oh. you know, Kauai or Hawaii is not a place you want to go to develop. So the business community joined up and helped us to start up an initiative campaign for the voters to vote and give us back the zoning. Oh, okay. And that's what we did. We had an initiative. We, we won the election on the initiative and got back the zoning again. <laughs> so it was kind of a crazy seesaw case. Sure. But, but that was a case that unfortunately took over a decade of my life. I wouldn't want to repeat it. Is that, I was just, is that difficult, particularly in a small community, and once things start getting really polarized, serving as an attorney for any side in that one, it seems like, could be a challenging. Uh... Well, it, uh, if I can just uh, spend a minute telling this funny story. My son at that time was about four or five years old. Yeah. And we went to the supermarket, and right on the front door, or front window, they had a post of me of about eight and a half by 11 sheet like that, and it said, you know, Nukuli and blah, 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 and Walton Hong representing mm -hmm. this developer, this developer. And he had my picture oh. taken over there. And my son looked up and he says, Daddy, somebody doesn't like you. <laughs> <laughs> so it was an interesting time. And, and how, what did you explain to him about that? I just told him that everybody's entitled to their opinion and sure. that's how the system works. And you have two sons? Two sons, yes. And did either of them go into law? Um, I talked to one of them out of, out of it. Out of it? Out of it, okay. because he's a very brilliant boy but it's one of those that whatever interests him today, he'll jump on that. Tomorrow, something else, he'll jump on that. And I was afraid. As an attorney, you have to finish up what are you doing. Uh, and I feel, he, I said he's brilliant, but he would have made, not have made a good attorney. <laughs> Gerald, you had mentioned before, you had a very brief stint in private practice. <laughs> very brief. And this was just, just before being elected, correct? Yeah. Tell us about that, okay. and, then, and then about getting elected. I want to hear how that went. <laughs> well, I was with the Public Defender's Office, yeah. 
And then the, the county of Kauai decided to make the prosecutor's office an elected office. So I, I wanted to run for that, so I put my name in. Once you, once you file your application to run for office, I had to you know, leave the public defender's office. So there was a six month gap, and I decided, okay, I'm gonna do some private work. And I was representing a lot of police officers in domestic cases representing friends on traffic tickets and all that. And it was an experience that uh, I wouldn't want to remember because <laughs> I had a lot of cases. We won a lot, most, mostly all of the cases, but I ended up with a deficit because I wasn't a able financial to, deficit. Financial no. deficit. Because I made the big mistake of paying for the filing fees, paying for the subpoenas, and never asking for reimbursement <laughs> over payment. Uh. So, and so it was time, a learning experience. <laughs> yes, you were big on experience and, and short on. Uh, I should have been on, with legal uh, aid. <laughs> <laughs> well, you, because you you jumped back and forth between one side and the other there, I mean, prosecutor and then uh, and then uh, public, uh, defender. public defender and. Yeah, I, went, I I switched because Don Tsukiyama became the state public defender. And he wanted to establish a full-time position on Kauai. Mm -hmm. And he and I have been friends from forever. So he said, you don't have a job right now because you left the county attorney's office. Would you be my deputy? He said, oh, well, you know, I've been a prosecutor almost all of my life, but OK, I'll go to the dark side for a while. <laughs> so I became a public defender. and. I enjoyed it. It was interesting. I would I would anticipate that on that side they were calling the other side the dark side. <laughs> yeah, I did that. I, I called the prosecutor side the dark side. <laughs> there you go. You know, it's funny when I hear Gerald mentioning all these different names. Yeah. I don't know how many of these are three-digit attorney numbers if they're even still practicing now. Things like memories. Yeah. Well, one of the gentlemen that was going to be here, another three-digit attorney, was Max Graham. Mm -hmm. yeah. And I did want to ask you because small community you've worked with him a lot what can you tell tell us about max since he isn't here to to say a, a little bit on his own or to rebut anything you say okay what i know of max is he used to handle a lot of uh, criminal cases when he first came to Kauai. now he's more into the the more lucrative side <laughs> but when he was handling criminal cases he was like the the brook heart of Kauai. Oh, <laughs> is that he, right he was very good he had a lot of criminal cases, and he did a great job for the defendants. He made the prosecutors work hard. <laughs> did you work, work with, uh, with him as well? No, I never did. I, I knew him very sparingly because of different types of practice until we started getting into um, development administrative law right. side. But, until, but before that, um, he was with what, Lowenthal? Yeah, August. August on, on Maui, and then he came to Kauai. And then he hooked up with Mike Bellis afterwards. Right. So, um, but until we hooked up with Mike Bellis, I didn't know him that well, just because of the different nature of our practice. Yeah. yeah. He was handling mostly criminal. But he, but he's a, I said, unqualifiedly, very well respected attorney. No yeah. his work. You know, I, I, and I had in, in my much more limited career in such one opportunity, uh, a couple of opportunities to work in uh, on a case. You know, opposite Max Graham. In one case, we were sort of oddly aligned in it, in it, I can tell you that uh, unequivocally, uh, you know, in it, a very brilliant guy, a very helpful person for, you know, how the guy coming from Honolulu and coming into to, to that community, he was uh, both ingratiating and, and, and just extremely helpful all the way along and, and, and helped, you know, our, our respective clients succeed in, in resolving things. I, I, I was very impressed and so I, I was sad not to see him here because the extent of our exchanges were all by telephone. <laughs> okay, yeah. Max is a real gentleman. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Gentleman well, and a scholar. We're really pleased. Well, Gerald, for you, at one point, you moved on to become a judge. Was that in the cards all along? Well, I think I wanted to become a judge because as a prosecutor, you make your recommendations and it's kind of frustrating when the, the court doesn't follow your recommendations. So I thought, well, if I become a judge, I could do my thing. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I enjoyed it, and then, but you know, because I came from a 
from both backgrounds, I think it helped me a lot because district court yeah. has a lot of criminal cases and I could see both sides. But when I, we, uh, on the Fifth Circuit, we also had to rotate in, uh, with family court. So we took district and family and civil and criminal. Yeah. Now it's sort of specialized. Yeah, Akoba <laughs> is family court only. Mm -hmm. And Trudy Senda is on the civil criminal. On the civil, okay. For you, now they say some judges come in and do a pretty quick switch. In fact, we, I think we were joking about some that have done that in terms of just whether it's personality or how strict they are about things or whatever. What, did that happen with you? No, I don't, I don't think so. I'm yeah. going to ask Walton. Yeah, you can ask Walton. I, I, don't, I don't think so. Uh, but I think you, you know, because I left the prosecutor's office to become a judge, I tried to really listen to the defense, uh, defense's arguments, especially Jim Jung, because he's a brilliant defense attorney. And the guy knows his law. And he made a lot of good arguments. And we made some new law with, with Jim yeah. Jung as a public defender. Well, did he change? <laughs> well, well, I never appeared much before in district court practice or family right. practice. So I never came before Judge Oh, Monaco. really? The entire I don't, time I don't believe I did. Huh? No. If I did, I probably lost. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I, I don't recall coming before Daryl. There was no money in district court. <laughs> Is that the reason? <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, we're going to come back. We're going to talk a little bit. Uh, at that point, I want to talk a little bit about what advice you would give to attorneys that are coming in now into practice. You are watching Hawaii's Living Legend Lawyers, uh, sponsored by the Hawaii State Bar Association, Think Tech Hawaii. I'm Craig Wagner. We'll be right back. Hi, Jay. Hi, Jay. <laughs> my name's Keith Bettinger. I knew that. And I'm the host of Think Tech Asia. I knew that, too. Here on Think Tech. Fabulous. Uh, You've got a great show going, Thank Keith. Thank you very much. And for uh, our viewers out there that are interested in Think Tech Asia, it airs every Tuesday from 4 to 4.45. And uh, it can be accessed online at thinktech.com. Yeah, so what kind of guests do you like? Well, we have a, a number of guests from, from academia, uh, from uh, practitioners of international affairs. Sometimes we have uh, military officials. Sometimes we have public officials on the show. And our goal, uh, we try to talk about uh, current issues in South Asia, Southeast Asia, East Asia, and Central Asia, all throughout the Asian realm in more depth than you would find in traditional mainstream that's media. the difference isn't it exactly that you're you're reaching out beyond what ordinary news media would do right we're and trying that's to, why we like you so much we're trying to provide a, a thinking person's perspective an intelligent perspective on what's going on and where both sides of the story or even when there's more than two sides we try to cover every angle and i think that that's uh that's uh, one of the big benefits that we provide here at ThinkTech is it's a really innovative source of educational programming for the people of Hawaii. You're great, Keith. You're, you are a great host. You've got a great show going on. I watch it every week. Thanks very Why much. Why don't you guys watch it every week too, okay? 4.45 to uh, 4 to 4.45 every Tuesday. <laughs> and we're back. I'm Craig Wagnold. I am serving as a host, and this is Hawaii's Living Legend Lawyers, brought to you by the Hawaii State Bar Association and Think Tech Hawaii. I want to remind those of you, if you're sitting there, if you're standing there, if you're lying there, whatever you're doing, to follow us on Twitter. You can, we, in fact, we're going to put up this. Look, we have over a thousand followers right now on Twitter at Think Tech Hawaii, H -I, uh, right there on your screen. You should be able to see that. You can click on that if you have Twitter and follow it and. and or whatever you do on Twitter. But we're not done yet today. So keep with us here because I have Gerald Matsunaga and Walton Hong, both from the island of Kauai and both uh, you know, preeminent attorneys there. One of you is retired. Yes. And that would be you, Gerald. Yes. You never decided to go on and keep practicing? No, not really. Uh, I think I've had enough. Uh, I'm satisfied. One of the things you ha have continued to do is is to serve uh, our bar association and such. You served on the board and were a tremendous yeah, help and, and support for I me. I serve on the liquor commission. I saw that. Credit union board. Not, not on the big board, but on the CUSO board. Okay. And I try to, you know, try to keep myself busy. I, every, every time I hear about you, it's something else and something else you're keeping Don't busy. Don't believe with, everything so. you hear. <laughs> But Walton, you're continuing to practice. Mm -hmm. 
How challenging is that for you? And what advice, and so you can lead right into it, what advice is it that you give for, you know, young attorneys that are now coming into the practice of law? Well, young attorneys come right on Kauai expecting to pick up a practice right away and get clients are going to have a tough time. Mm -hmm. Only because the population on Kauai is probably about 65,000. I don't know how many attorneys we have in private practice, quite a few. Um, and that's why a lot of them do come in, start working for the prosecutor's office, public defender's office, sure. government practice. Then if things pan out, then they'll go and branch out into private practice. Right. Um, advice I can give them is several fold. Number one is be prepared. You know, neighbor island practice might seem casual, but um, if you're not prepared, the judges know you're not prepared. And you can get eaten up very, very easily. Yeah. So, and, you know, it's very tough because you think it's not like, I guess, Honolulu practice. I've never practiced in Honolulu, but the stories I hear is, you know, you put in countless hours a week, and you do this, and you do this, and Kauai is more like, okay, more of a casual thing. Mm -hmm. um, granted, there are some government attorneys that work really, really hard. Mm -hmm. um, but, so be prepared, and the parting advice I can give, well, actually, let me, let me, if I can stay for a minute. Sure. When I first worked for the Attorney General's Office, I had a senior deputy um, guiding me, William Yim. Uh, Bill Yim, and fortunately he passed away a few years ago. And he gave me two bits of advice that I can pass on. One is, if you put enough feathers on the scale, it's going to tip in your favor. And simple things, like correctly addressing the court, acting properly with proper courtesy, these are little things that in and of itself doesn't count. But you get enough of it, it tips the scale. The second thing he told me is kind of funny, but it makes a lot of sense now. If you pound too many nails in a coffin, the corpse will wake up. Right? That being, if you've got enough to prove your case, enough. Stop and let it go. Okay. And I still remember those two bits of advice. And that this helped me for you know, a number of years, yeah. past years. The part of thing I'd like to tell the younger attorneys, um, if I can, is you're young, you're starting off, it's going to be amazing how fast the year is going to catch up with you. Um, and plan for your later years. And maybe circumstance will make it where you can't. But if you can, then when you come at that time, when you have, when they'll have a 4D program, <laughs> four digit numbers versus three digit, you can come here and say, I plan for my retirement, or I planned for whatever it was. Well, I'm going to write some of these down for me here. <laughs> and I'm not that young, unfortunately. Make sure you bill your clients. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, okay, now that's good advice. That's, that's number one. But, but Joe, you know, a number of things that you're known for, obviously, being a gentleman, being a, a wise and fair judge. But what advice do you provide, or what, what advice do you have for young attorneys? I would echo a lot of the things that Walton talked about. But I think, uh, you know, attorneys have to be prompt and they have to be prepared. You cannot let the opposing counsel or let, uh, you know, the court wait for you. Be, be on time, be early, be prepared because don't come there and flip through your folder trying to learn the case. You should know your case okay. inside and out. And I think they have to learn how to be humble. They need to be nice and respectful to their coworkers as well as staff because it goes a long way if you're you know you, you be nice to your staff your staff will take care of you they'll cover for you all the time yeah but if you're nasty they're not going to <laughs> always true whether with anybody yeah right? so you know try to be nice to people especially those that you work with you know, they say a, a good litigator would tell you that, that you should never ask a question that you don't already know the answer to. And I'm going to break from that a little bit because I, I, I want to ask each of you this question, and, I, and I'll start with you, Joe. Knowing what you know now about what it takes to practice law, about all that's involved with it and such, and particularly doing it on, on the island of Kauai and where you grew up and, and such, but would you do it again? Would you make that choice again, or would you do something else? Yes, I would do it again. I think... Uh 
I would like to thank Chief Justice Wilfred Tsukiyama for guiding me to do the right thing. Because if it wasn't for him, I probably would be working out in a construction site. But it but, sounds like he, he encouraged you to go forward, but more than anything, he sort of challenged you as well. He did. He, he, he was a very amazing man, uh, you know, and he didn't, he didn't push you, but he made you think about it, yeah. and then he led you to the right decision. I, I, I really admire the man. I, I told you about his, about what he used to have as his present every year. What was a that? A dictionary. That's right, because he, he read the dictionary. He right? read the dictionary, and he knew every word in the English dictionary, the Japanese, Chinese, Spanish, yeah, German. Yes, so he spoke a number of languages. Yeah. And as I told you earlier, the most impressive thing was when uh, there were some German justices that came to Hawaii. Yeah. And nobody could communicate with them. And Chief Justice Tsukiyama said, let me try. And I couldn't believe it. He spoke fluent wow. German. And he was conversing with them, and everybody was like, wow. <laughs> How did he do it? <laughs> you know, he, it's amazing. He has photographic memory, but yet he could piece together the words to make sentences. Yeah. The guy was amazing. Well, how about you? You do it again? You do something else? You know, I don't know. <laughs> okay. Sometimes I think that I take, choose the right path. Mm -hmm. And other times I say, well, this particular thing, for example, made it worthwhile. And so it, it, it's, it's a toss-up. Um, I've had some cases where there wasn't a dollar amount involved. In fact, I remember one case we had a, it was an elderly part of wine lady that wanted to adopt her great-grandson for the Hawaiian homeland. At least you could pass mm, it on. Right, But right. it had to be through adoption. It cannot be just passing on beyond what a second generation, next generation, something like that. And she came in to see us, and we thought, okay, the filing fee is going to be so much for filing the adoption case and whatnot. And then when I found out she was making like about, I thought it was $188 a month oh. on her pension or whatever benefit she had. We, when she said, okay, how much do I owe you? And we said, just the filing fee. Oh, that wow. was it. And, and, and that's a policy that I've tried to carry over in my firm at least where if people need help, um, we try to bend over backwards, but keeping in mind that we still have an office to run, that you still have the expenses. Yeah. But once in a while, as telling Gerald on site, neighbor island practice is different. Um, I don't know how it is in Honolulu, but I make house calls. I make hospital <laughs> calls. Yeah. You know, in fact, I, I, this, very, this morning I got a call from a client that needs help, so tomorrow morning, I'm going to the hospital to have her sign documents. Because mm. it's too much of a problem for her to go home and my having to go out there or her from coming to, sure. to my office. And that's, that's the nature of island practice. Yeah. But there's, a, there's a part of that that has to be somewhat enjoyable as well. I mean, you, it is. You, yeah, it you're is. really helping people in a number of ways, mm. not just in the legal capacity, but also you know, showing up for them where they need you. Yeah, and then we have a couple of people that um, develop from a client into being um, Really, really good friends. Yeah. You know, I've heard that having had the, you know, the, the pleasure of doing this a number of times now and, and meeting, in the, you know, uh, our three-digit attorneys from a number of places, including Maui here on Honolulu. I, I, I think that one overriding message has been that the, the, the things that have struck them the most have been how, when they've been able to help clients. Not not the big money or the the, the ones that the, the cases that were in the news or. or such, but, but more particularly the, how grateful many attorneys had, had been, uh, I mean many of their clients had been for what they've been able to do for them. Is that, I mean, am I echoing a sentiment that, that, that each of you has had? Yeah, I think so. At least on Kauai has, my, has been my experience, I don't know what it is on the other islands, but I'm assuming it's going to be the very similar on the neighbor island, Maui. Um, big island. Big island. Honolulu, I don't know enough, <laughs> but practically Fair Honolulu. Enough. Well, gentlemen, it's been wonderful talking to you. We've had a great opportunity to speak with Gerald Matsunaga and Walton Hong, both from the island of Kauai, our Garden Isle, both attorneys that are part of our Hawaii living legends. Wow. 
This show has been brought to you by the Hawaii State Bar Association, State Tech Hawaii. I'm Craig Wagnall. It's been an honor to host this, to be a part of this. Stay tuned. There are plenty more of these coming up. And if you haven't seen them all, they're available online. Follow on Twitter. I mentioned that earlier. And we'll be back again next week with another episode. Thanks again. Have a good day.